Um, let me pray. Let me pray. Father, I want to thank you for your word. Lord, I want to thank you for this path that we have been going down um, for the last few months, just talking about renewing our minds. And Father, I pray today, Lord, would you, uh, Father, open our ears to hear whatever it is that the Holy Spirit wants to speak to each of us individually in this room. Would you open our eyes today to see the things that we need to see so that we, each of us individually, can continue down this journey of knowing what it means to renew our minds. What does it mean to live for Jesus in 2024 in the times and the seasons that we're in? We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Have you got a, a, a collection of ancient documents there that we like to call a Bible? Uh, written over 1,600 years, three separate continents. Pretty amazing miracle that we've even got this thing still here today. But it's here because God wants us to have it. So until God's had enough of it, it's not going to disappear, no matter what countries and nations and dictators and warlocks try to do to get rid of it. So if you've got one of those with you, can you turn to, uh, to Romans chapter 12 for me, please? And we're going to continue down this path we've been going down. Uh, where are we? Let me just back up a little bit here. We've been talking about renewing our mind and what it means to renew our mind. We've been talking about different aspects of renewing our mind. Uh, we started out talking about uh, renewing our mind in terms of our own growth and development and maybe things that we'd heard and been told and stuff we'd listened to before we came to faith and how that shapes us and molds us, the way we see ourselves, the way we see our neighbour, the world around us and God. And we kind of moved on from that and now we're beginning to talk about renewing our mind from the perspective of more external as opposed to internal, how we see ourselves. But now we're moving towards how we see the world around us. How many of you know we live in a world today that doesn't necessarily see things the way that this collection of ancient documents encourages Christ followers to see it? Amen? We live in interesting times with a lot of interesting ideas and thoughts floating out there. Yet Paul writes to the Roman Christians, and here's what he says to them. This is 2,000 odd years ago. After giving Romans chapter 1 to 11, which is all this deep theological understanding of our faith, he then goes right. Uh, uh, in, in verse 2 of Romans chapter 12, he says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. We've already talked about this. How do you be conformed to the pattern of the world? Just don't do anything. It'll just naturally happen because you're soaking and marinating in this world every day of your life. So if you want to be conformed to the world, just sit back and go with the flow. But he gives us an alternative. He says, don't just be conformed to the pattern of the world. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, you don't have to be conformed to the pattern of the world. You can be transformed, but it's going to take a bit of work on your part. It's going to take a little bit of work on your part. What are you going to have to do? You're going to have to renew your mind. You're going to have to change the way that you think. And the way we renew our mind is we get into this Ancient documents, this collection of ancient documents that we call the Bible that gives us a bit of insight into who God is, how God sees us, how God sees the world. It's a little bit like uh, I started sharing a story two weeks ago and I didn't finish it. Anyone pick up on that? I started telling you about my VHS machine. Anyone else pick up on that? Now I got caught up on the Dire Straits concert and then went back and forgot to tell you what my point was. My point was this. If, if I had that VHS machine, to get the most use out of that, I had to. the best thing to do was to get a hold of the manual. Amen? Read the manual. Some of you guys have got these things called mobile phones, and I'll bet you, you only know about 6% of what it does. And you'd probably be amazed at what you can do with a mobile phone if you would take time to actually read the manual and have a look, and you'd be, your eyes would be opened up to, wow, this thing's amazing. It, it, you, I don't have to cook anymore. I don't put washing on anymore. It does it all for me. You would be amazed at what you can do with these things. But we, we, what we do is we just do the basics and then move on from there and we get stuck in this one-dimensional use of our phones. Well, we can be a bit like that with life. That's why I think God has taken this collection of ancient documents and by his spirit preserved it for thousands of years so that we have basically our manual. This is our manual for life. And we need to spend some time and get in it. Unfortunately, the Western church in particular, we are in a season of incredible biblical illiteracy. Because people don't want to read their Bibles anymore. We've convinced ourselves we are too busy, we don't have enough time, and it's not true. We are just too distracted, and it's not a priority. We've got to be honest and own it. It's not a priority anymore. But as children of God, as, as God's kids, we need to reprioritize our lives. And the starting point here is we need to be transformed by renewing our minds. Let's get back into the Word of God. Let's start to look at how God sees life. Let's start to look at the way that He tells us to perceive ourselves, the way He tells us to perceive others. But let us have a look at what He says about Himself instead of just listening to the pattern of the world when they tell us this is who God is and this is who you should be and this is what should be of most importance and so on. 
So we're looking at this whole idea of being transformed by renewing our minds. And then he says, at the end of that, he says, and then, only then, only when you've, we've been transformed by renewing your mind, only then will you be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If we don't get into the word of God to transform our mind, the truth is this, you'll never fully understand or know the will of God. You won't. You won't know the will of God by watching CNN. You're not going to know the will of God by, by reading the newspaper. You're not going to know the will of God by just listening to your feelings. You're going to know the will of God by getting into the word of God, having your mind transformed. I don't like using the term biblical because I think it narrows things down. People say this is biblical parenting. I don't like narrowing things down like that, but I do know that we need to learn to think more biblically than perhaps many of us do at the moment. And so this word from Paul is so relevant for us. Do not be conformed to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That word transformed is the, 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 uh, the Greek word metamorpho. Anyone ever do biology class at school? Metamorpho? Yeah. Metamorpho means this. It means to change into another form. Right? It's like anyone know the picture that you're taught in biology class of a... Come on. Caterpillar. Yeah, he beat you. Rod, Rod Beecher. Caterpillar. So a caterpillar goes into this cocoon, into this environment. And while, it's, while it's in this environment, it is transformed and then it comes out as this beautiful butterfly with all of these colours. The word metamorphosis, it comes from the word metamorpho. And the word metamorphosis means to change from an immature form to an adult form. And that's what we're trying to do by renewing our minds. We're trying to go from an immature form into an adult form. We're growing in our faith. We're getting to know God more. We're getting to understand God more. Often in the uh, letters that were written by the likes of Paul and Peter and so on, they would challenge their audiences and say, you know, you should be eating meat now, but you're still drinking milk. It says, you, 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 by this stage I should be taking you beyond these, but I'm still back here in these elementary things. He, he talks to them in this sense that, that growth is not something spiritually that happens just because of time. You can be someone that gave your life to Jesus 30 years ago and still be less mature than a person who gave their life to Christ six months ago because they've got into the Word of God and they're transforming their mind. And they're doing the stuff. They're practicing the life of Jesus down here. The US National Center for Biotechnology and Information says this. It says, During metamorphosis, developmental processes are reactivated by specific hormones, and I like this second bit, and the entire organism changes to prepare itself for its new mode of existence. I love that. The entire organism changes itself to prepare itself. Who wrote that? That's terrible spelling. I did, just letting you know. The, the entire organism changes itself to prepare itself for its new mode of existence. And that's what's happening when we are metamorphosing, when we're being transformed by the renewing of our mind. We are being transformed and changed so that we can live out this new mode of existence down here on earth. Because we live differently. We think differently. We act differently. The environment that we're in is the same, but it's the organism that changes. And we are the organism that God wants to change. Amen? Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks a little bit about this new way of living uh, in verse 17. And then uh, he says, So I tell you this. He says, I insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. No longer live that way. And he goes on, he says, How do they live? Well, they live in the futility of their what? Their thinking. He says, Now that you're born again, now that you're following Jesus, he says, I want you to stop living that way now. We're going we're gonna to be transformed. We're going to be metamorphosed by, by, by renewing our mind. Because if you don't, you'll just be like the rest of the Gentiles and you'll keep living in the futility of your own thinking. Why? Because your thinking's been conformed to the pattern of the world. So we've got to change the way that you think if you want to change the way that you live. And then he goes on in verse 20 to 24. He says, that, however... Living in the futility of your, your thinking. He says, that, however, is not the way of life you learned. I love that. Christianity is a way of life. He says, that is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. Who's, who's putting off the old self? We play a role in this, don't we? We're active participants in our own spiritual growth. We're active participants in what God is doing in us and also what the Lord wants to do through us. He says, he says you need to, to put off your old self, which has been corrupted by its deceitful desires. The old self, how many of you know you still got a bit of the old self in there? I, I still battle it. I've still got some of the old self in there. And, and he's telling these people, he's saying, you want to put that off because that thing is corrupting you from the inside out. 
That thing has a set of desires. It's been conformed to the pattern of the world and it's pulling you a certain way. He's saying you've got to do the work of putting that off. And how, how do we do the work of putting that off? We start by renewing our mind. Because then we begin to see those desires for what they really are. They're not helping me. They're not drawing me closer to Christ. They're not making me a more loving person. They're, they're, they're not, they're not uh, uh, making me a better witness, a stronger presence for God down here on the earth. They're taking me in the other direction. He says you've got to put off that old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your what? Minds. There it is again. He says you've got to be made new in the attitude of your mind and put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. See, this world and its systems and its structures are heading in a certain direction. Sometimes it's so easy for us as Christians to sit here, point a finger at the world and where it's going and what's happening and get all judgmental and so on. We probably every now and then need to turn the finger a little bit on the inside and go, hang on a second. If I want that to change out there, I've got to make sure this in here is changing. I've got to make sure this is changing in here too. I've got to make sure that I'm allowing myself to be transformed and conformed to the image of God. And becoming the person that I'm meant to be. Because if I'm the person that I'm meant to be living down here on earth, guess what? I'll have a way better uh, opportunity to speak into culture, push back against culture, be the change that I want to see. Many Christians get bitter and twisted and angry. And we react out of, out, of, out of anger. We react out of all kinds of other stuff. And we get so caught up pointing fingers and poking fingers out there. Don't realize that, hey, it's, it's, it's some of our own desires in here have still got control of our own life. The only place in the world where I have 100% authority is, is this body. I'm, this, this, this is it. I've got 100% authority over this thing here standing before you. And I apologize for this. I'm not taking enough authority over this part of it. But I've got authority over this. And I need to take authority over me first so that I can speak properly and act properly and try to be the change that God wants. In John 17, 14 to 16, Jesus said this. He said, I've given them your word, speaking, he's praying for his, his believers, his, his disciples, and those that will believe through him. And he says, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them. There's something about the word of God. And we're seeing it, aren't we, in this current generation, more and more we are seeing there's something about the word of God that, that, that brings out hatred, anger, animosity towards the church. Now, now, now we, can, we can avoid that by just not really paying too much attention to the word. And then we can avoid all that. But if, but, but if we're going to pay attention to the Word and renew our minds and be transformed by, the, by, by, by getting into the Word of God, then guess what? I'm sorry. I don't like it any more than you do. I hate it. But the fact is that that's going to create a certain amount of animosity and angst that comes back our way. I know we want to avoid it. We're going to talk about that in a second. See, the world has hated them for they're not of the world any more than I'm of the world. He says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world. but you protect them from the evil one. Don't take them out of the world because I need them in the world. But what I want you to do is to protect them from that spirit that wants to conform them to the pattern of this world. One of the ways that he has protected us is he's given us his word so that we can get into this and we can renew our minds. See, we live in the same place as everybody else, but we live in the same place differently. That's the point. We're not called to retreat from the world, but we're called to live differently in the world. And living differently implies that there'll be points where we think differently and there'll be points where we believe differently. In fact, if you don't think and believe differently, you probably won't live any different. If we don't think differently and we don't believe differently, we probably won't live any differently. And the church and the world can cohabitate and play in the same playgrounds and we can be best mates. But we're living in a time where that's becoming harder and harder to do. And I know this about the world. At least the world has integrity. They won't compromise. <laughs> Sorry, but the world and its systems has integrity in that sense. They're not going to compromise. And so in the name of love, we go, oh, we'll, keep, we'll, keep, we'll compromise here and I'll compromise there and I'll compromise there just in the name of love to keep peace. How far do you compromise? How much peace do you try to keep before you don't exist anymore? And this is the season and the times that we live in. So renewing our minds is the process God uses to change us into the person he wants us to be. It's the process of growing up in God from immaturity to adult. It's how we prepare ourselves for our new mode of existence here in the world. Now here's the thing. Here's the thing. 
That doesn't mean that just because we're exposing ourselves to the teachings in the Bible that we're going to automatically be transformed. The thing is that we have to accept the teachings that are in the Word of God. Amen? We can know it till we're blue in the face. The thing is we need to come to a place of accepting that, that, that what Jesus taught, what God teaches, this is the way that life is for us as a new creation, as believers. We need to follow what God has to say. Um, John chapter 6 has this interesting story. John chapter 6, verse 60. Uh, and then we'll pick up 66 through to 68. Jesus has just had a, uh, he, he's done a miracle, fed heaps of people and then jumped on a boat and went to the other side of the lake. They were so impressed with him. People chased him, got off the other side and, and they're impressed with, with all that he's doing and they're following him physically. And then Jesus makes this statement. He starts to talk to them about it. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're not worthy to be my disciple. That's a heavy, heavy statement, you know? And he's not saying that you need to physically eat human beings and be a cannibal. That's not what he's saying, right? What he's saying is you need to partake of my death, my burial, and my resurrection. He's saying you've got, to, you've got to participate in this event. You're not going to physically be on a cross, but you're going to have to die as well and be resurrected to new life. This is what he's talking about here. And it says on hearing it, many of his disciples, John uses the words disciples. He says these guys were considered disciples in the moment. He says on hearing it, many of his disciples said this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Who can accept it? Now, this is the point where most of us today, if I was a pastor preaching this, and, and, and then it says they turned around and started walking away, I'd be going, hang on, come back. Sorry, that's not what I meant. Sorry, sorry, I've been hard, it's been hard, my bad. I'm learning, please, sorry. You know, I didn't mean. But, but, but Jesus doesn't seem to do that. He just says, this is, this, is, this is how it is. This is how God has designed the world. This is, this is, this is the truth of the moment. This is what is happening. And then in verse 66 to 68, it says, From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And then Jesus turns to the 12 and he says, Do you guys want to go too? There's the door. Who does that? He obviously hasn't read books on church growth because you don't do that, you know? But Jesus doesn't really care about church growth. He just, I think he's more concerned about church health, he wants a healthy body. He doesn't want a body that's, that's huge and massive but can't function properly. He just wants a healthy body, you know? And, and so anyway, he turns to the 12 and says, do you want to go? And Simon Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You are the one that has the words of eternal life. So the truth is this. Jesus never tailored his teachings to fit the beliefs of the crowds. He expected the crowd to tailor their beliefs to fit in with his teachings. And many people don't like it. They didn't like it back then, and we live in a day and age today where we still don't. Anyone here ever feel that way about the teachings of God? Ever come across something and you think, gee, that's a bit harsh? No? I do. I'll put my hands up. I do. I've been following Jesus for 30-odd years, and I still think some of the stuff he says is harsh. <laughs> I do. You ever read any of the teachings of Jesus and think, gee, that's, that's a little bit outdated, that one? I mean, we're a modern, sophisticated, scientific, sexually free society. That one's a bit outdated, that one. You know, Jesus, if you come and spend a bit of time in 2024, you'd probably change your mind about some of that stuff. I don't know that he would. That one's a bit old-fashioned. Do you ever think that? That's a bit old-fashioned. What? Oh, come on. Even that's a bit offensive. It's a bit offensive. Jesus was quite offensive at times, wasn't he? I, I don't know. I've, I've had some heavy discussions with people I didn't agree with. I've never said to them, you brood of vipers. <laughs> I never said that sort of stuff. I, I don't speak that way because I'm too nice. I'm loving. I don't want to hurt people. You know what? Jesus is more loving than me and wants to hurt people less than me, yet he was much more honest. He didn't mind. He didn't mind. Now, here's the thing. We've probably all felt that way at different times and probably still feel that way, and we're not alone. Now, if there's anybody in the New Testament, any human being in the New Testament that's going to uh, 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 make the mistake of letting all of us know that he's fully human, it's going to be Peter. So if there's anything you want to learn about humanity and, and following Jesus and the fact that you don't have to be perfect, just look at Peter. Every time he opens his mouth or takes a step, so often he just reveals his humanity. And I love that about Peter. And there's a story in Matthew chapter 16 where Peter allows his humanity to come on out. And I'm sure many of us can relate to this. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 to 24, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now, just before this, the very first verses leading into this, Jesus has said to his disciples, Who do men say I am? Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say this. Some say that. And then he says, But who do you say I am? Right? And Peter goes, you are the Christ, 
the son of the living God. Jesus gets excited about that and says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. You you don't know this stuff, Peter, unless the father has given you revelation. Good on you, Peter. Double thumbs up emoji. You got it. And Peter's sitting there going, woohoo, you other 11, did you see that? I got the answer right. You know? It's me, look at me. How come you didn't know that? And what didn't you say? Well, I said it first, what about you? I can just see Peter sitting there thinking, man, I'm the king of the world. And then a couple of verses later, a couple of verses later, Jesus begins to say, because they got the revelation, they know who he is. So he goes, okay, you are my people now. You're in connection with God, you know me. So I'm going to start talking straight down the line with you. Cut the barrels and then I'm going straight to the point. And he says, here's the deal. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to take me. They're going to beat me. They're going to kill me. And I'm going to raise from the dead. No more parables. No more. You try to work it out. Here's how it is. He gives it to them plainly. And Peter, verse 22, took him aside and began to rebuke him. Wow. Peter begins to rebuke him. And he says, never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Wow, I think that, 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 hey, flesh and blood has not revealed this. You went to his head. All of a sudden, he's now he's telling Jesus what to do. Now he's telling the Messiah, the one, you are the son of God. Now he's telling him what to do. Peter, calm down, dude. Calm down a little bit. And Jesus, in verse 23, turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, from the spiritual penthouse to the spiritual outhouse in five verses. That's a massive fall. You know, that's huge. Can you imagine being Peter there? And then Jesus says, Satan is like, oh, hang on. And the other 11 are going, oh, you think, yeah, yeah. Got you now. He says, get behind me, Satan. And he says this, you're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Here's the point. It's totally possible to be born again, be a disciple of Jesus, but to still think differently than him. That's why we need to renew our minds. That's why we need to renew our minds. Peter finds the way of Jesus really, really hard to accept. Why? Well, Jesus sums it up this way. He says, you are more concerned with the things of men than you are the things of God. You're more concerned with the impact here and people than you are with God's plan. You're more concerned with the will of men than you are with the will of God. Now, the truth is this. We don't know exactly what those concerns were. We don't know that because we don't have that in here. But because Peter's human like the rest of us, I think I might be able to assume three possible answers to that. You know, in the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at the following topics. And we're going to be looking at them from the Word of God and what I... I'm committed to presenting what I believe to be a biblical perspective on these different things. In the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at the issue of marriage. We're going to be looking at the issue of gender. We're going to be looking at the issue of equality. And we're going to be looking at the issue of authority. Four things that I think in our current culture are being massively attacked and being dragged off in a direction that certainly goes against the Judeo-Christian ethic and what I believe to be the teachings of the Word of God. We're going to go down this path in the next few weeks and we're going to start to talk about some of these things. I want to see what the Bible says about these issues to the best of our ability. And the truth is this. You may struggle with some of the some, same concerns that Peter does. So instead of waiting for the, the potential stumbling blocks to arise, I want to throw out a few potential stumbling blocks for you right now and have a look at what Jesus' response was to those. So in the few minutes we've got left, what are some of the concerns that Peter and maybe some other followers of Jesus in 2024 have? Number one, could be that we're concerned about how this truth will impact us. If you're following a rabbi, and what you need to understand is back in Jesus' time, Being a disciple and following a rabbi meant something that in 2024 in the Western world we have no idea about. We don't connect with it because we don't have a lot of similar things. The best best modern word we have to replace disciple would be apprentice. But the thing is with an apprentice, an apprentice can tell their boss to go jump and walk away and there's no, you know, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. But if you were a disciple of a rabbi, you didn't do that. You committed everything to that following that rabbi. You, you, you followed that rabbi where that rabbi went. You did what that rabbi said. 
And if that rabbi had an interpretation of something, you adopted their interpretation, even if yours was different. That's how serious they took following a rabbi. And so if you're Peter and Jesus says, um, uh, I'm about to die, they're going to take me and so on, I can understand that maybe Peter's going, well, how does this impact me? Because the truth of the matter is, if my rabbi is going there, it means I'm going there too. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. You're going to go to a cross, and, and they're going to, the authority is going to take you and beat you and so on. Well, I'm following you, so that means I'm going to have to go through this process too, and I'm going to have to go. Th- and, and so sometimes when we hear the teachings of the Word of God, sometimes what holds us back, sometimes what keeps us from embracing or agreeing or accepting is this question of how does that impact me? What impact does that teaching actually have on me? I remember when I first got saved and uh, uh, this, this guy, 19 years of age, this guy comes to my caravan I was living in at the time and said, uh, you've given your life to Jesus, now I've got to go through your music collection and uh, you know, get rid of everything that's, that's from the devil. And so, I mean, I had, music was, was my God. So I had thousands of dollars of vinyl and, and, and all kinds of things. And he comes into my house and he just, and I thought, you know, he'd probably take three or four of them and go, yeah, that's no good. He just went, devil, 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 devil. And literally, I had nothing left at all. Not a single CD or anything left. He was throwing out U2 um, um, albums. And like the bottom line, was, if I had that record collection today, it would be worth thousands of dollars. But you know what? I was so hungry for God. I just said, yep, no worries. That must be right. So I went along with it. And I took all that stuff and I put it in a garbage bag. I jumped in my dad's old, smelly, Kilrust Brown XA Falcon that had a hole in the floor and a metal bar coming through it because the stick shift broke and he couldn't get the part, so he just cut a hole in the floor and stuck a steel rod through it. It was a terrible, terrible car. I jumped in the car, drove down to the tip, I threw them out, and then I thought, hang on, no, God, if this is really that bad, I can't have anybody else having them. So I got in the car, put it in reverse, I backed over the bags, fought it over the bags, backed over the bags, fought it over the bags. Got a little more mature in the Lord and have spent a lot of years trying to find some of that stuff again, but you can't find it because it wasn't all that bad. It wasn't all that bad. But I was told to get rid of it, and so I did. By somebody I thought knew better. Now, it wasn't Jesus, it was a man, but that's what I did. And sometimes when I think of teachings, I think, man, that one really cost me. That one really cost me. So, so, so if I hear this other teaching over here, well, how's that going to impact me? Because I know this about the teachings of Jesus. They're meant to have an impact on our lives. They're meant to have an impact on our lives. They're not just things that we put up here, uh, pieces of information that we slot in a filing cabinet in our brain, and we'll get to it later. No, Jesus' teaching has an impact on human society. It's had an impact on human beings from the very time that Jesus walked. In fact, the teachings of God from the very book of Genesis had an impact. Don't do this, this will happen. They did it, that happened. And we're all sitting here today in the consequence of that. God doesn't just throw out good ideas. He's not a philosophizer just going, oh, this might be good. I think He's going, no, no, this is how it works. This is how it works, and this is how it works best. What the Bible reveals about human sexuality impacts people's lives. Do we have the authority to choose our own gender? Are we free to try before we buy when it comes to sex outside of marriage? Are we free to pick between same-sex sexual relationships and opposite-sex sexual relationships? Do we have that freedom, or is there some kind of narrative there from God that gives us railway tracks and tells us this is how it is? Because if it does, then, then this teaching impacts us in different ways. If we can find an answer to these questions in the Word of God, then we're faced with a decision as to what we do with that. Do we believe it? Do we live it out? Do we ignore it? Either way, it's going to have an impact on my life. It's going to have an impact on my life. What the Bible reveals about material possessions, about wealth, about generosity, about greed, it impacts people's lives. It forces us to ask questions like, when is enough enough? What does enough actually look like? How do I balance generosity in the now with financial security in the future? It has an impact on me. Should I be planning for the future, or did Jesus really mean don't worry about it? I've got to wrestle with these things because that teaching has an impact on me. What about teaching on suffering, on justice, morality, teaching on identity, etc.? It's all going to have an impact on me in some way, shape, or form. And we need to be humble enough as well to accept that different truths are going to have different impacts on different people. Different truths will have different impacts on different people. A teaching on marriage is going to have less impact on a marriage that just seems to work because two personalities just kind of gelled really, really well. But what if you're in a marriage where your personalities didn't click as well, but you're still in that marriage? 
I remember hearing a preacher say once that he had a, a, a friend of his and this friend of his, had uh, they, they, they just didn't gel him and his wife and they had so much stuff to work through to make their marriage work. And he made this statement. He said, me and my wife, we get on really, really well. We already think the same. We think about parenting the same. We came together. We thought about money the same. Our faith was at the same place, all this stuff. And he said this. He said, my friend, who's, people would look at that marriage, you go, that's not as good as yours. But he said this, that couple have to do a lot more in obedience to scripture to keep that marriage together than me and my wife do. Different truths have different impacts on different people. They have different impacts on different people because of the way we're made. Teaching on sexuality may have less impact on a person attracted to the opposite sex as opposed to a person who struggles with same-sex attraction. We need to acknowledge that. Different teachings will have different impacts on people. We can't just be hardline and well, it's all about the rules. There are people involved in these discussions and these things we're going to talk about. There are people involved. And, and whilst we may not agree with them, and there might be a lot of stuff going on that is wrong, we cannot lose sight of the fact that God still loves those people. They're still made in his image. I would rather win people than win arguments. Yeah. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean compromise. I think we win people by not compromising. But not compromising in love. Teaching on loving your enemies may be harder for a person who's been physically abused as opposed to a person who's had a small lie told about them. The different teachings are going to impact us in different ways, and we need to understand that. Giving Caesar what he Caesar's, paying your taxes might be easier when you earn a 55 grand a year. What if you earn a 55 million? Are you looking for loopholes in the tax system? Are you trying to cut back on your taxes because all of a sudden your tax bill's X amount of million? Might be a little bit different, a little bit harder for that person in that situation. Matthew left his tax booth to follow Jesus when Jesus told him to. It had an impact on his life. The rich young ruler walked away when Jesus said, sell everything, come follow me. He said no, walked away. It had an impact on his life. The crowds dropped their stones when Jesus challenged their right to judge the woman caught in adultery. It had an impact on their life. And the point is that all of, all of the teachings of the word of God should be having an impact on our life. They have an impact on our lives. John chapter 12, verse 42 to 43. I didn't put this up there. Very sad story. It says, yet at the same time, even among the leaders, many of the leaders believed in Jesus. These are the religious leaders of the time. It says this, but because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they'd be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Confessing Jesus was going to have an impact on them. They were going to get kicked out of the synagogue there, which was not just a church service. It was their place of social life and so on. They were going to be kicked out of that. So the teachings of Jesus are going to have an impact on us. And sometimes what we've got to do, though, is not allow the, the concern that we have for the impact of what that means on me to be the excuse as to why I can't accept it. The second thing, maybe, maybe the second thing that Peter was thinking was we can be concerned about how this truth will impact other people. Because we love people. Hands up if you love people. I love people. I love people. I don't want to see people hurt. I don't like seeing people disappointed. I don't like seeing people feeling ostracized or left out. I don't like that. It's not in my heart to, to want to have that. Now, Peter could have been thinking that, you know, if you're going to build your following, Jesus, do you realize once this teaching gets out, nobody's going to want to follow you, God. Nobody's going to fo want to follow you, Jesus. They're not going to want to uh, walk to their own death. They're not going to be, want to be told what's right and wrong. They're not want to, going to want to be told what, what, what ethics look like or, or they're not going to want to be told what marriage looks like. They're not going to want to be told uh, uh, that, that, they, that, they can, that they find their identity in you. Like, there's some stuff they're not going, going to want to be told, Lord, because it's going to have an impact on other people, not just myself. I think that's one of the reasons why it's so easy these days to not talk about a lot of this stuff. Because we love people. And we don't want people sitting there feeling like there's something wrong with them or feeling like we're, we're ostracizing them or whatever. But it doesn't change the fact that in different ways we all feel that way in society, don't we, at different times? We all feel that way at certain times. I've got to be honest, as a white heterosexual Christian male, I feel ostracized at times in today's society. It's just the way it is. Just the way it is. Doctrine's not the bait we use to attract people. And when it is, then you need to compromise on... When it is... You will compromise on the truth because truth is that which we need to hear, not always what we want to hear. Truth is what we need to hear, not always what we want to hear. I, I, we lived in, in India and there was an African minister in India. He would walk into the slums and he would tell these people in the slums. Uh, we, we were doing uh, uh, ministry with this guy and we got there. And he would tell these poor slum people, he'd say, anybody here want a job? And of course, they're all out of work living in a slum. And he'd go, come to Jesus, he'll give you a job. Anybody want to be healed? Come to Jesus, he'll heal you. Anybody want money? Yeah, come to Jesus, he'll give you money. And he threw out all this stuff that just was not true just in order to get them to come. He didn't want to say, you know what? You need Jesus because right now you're a sinner 
standing before one day a holy God. And you're not going to be good enough. You don't need Jesus just because of all the benefits and things he'll give you. You need Jesus because you need Jesus. And I can't guarantee you that if you come to faith, he's going to give you money. I can't guarantee you that. What I'm going to guarantee you, though, is if you start living for him and walking with him, the kind of prosperity that comes down into your world, I'll let God decide what that prosperity looks like. But I'll tell you this, you'll have peace in your heart. You'll know your sins are forgiven. And you'll have a, a quality of life down here that far supersedes anything that any type of material possession could bring into your world if you'll fully embrace Jesus. But see, he left certain things out. Didn't want to talk about that stuff, threw out other things, and used this as bait to try to get people to come to Jesus. The fact is, one day people wake up and they realize, you know what, that's actually not true. And when we avoid talking about certain things, same thing happens. We draw people in there one day, they go, hang on a second, you didn't tell me that God had a sexual ethic. Hang on, you never told me that, that the Bible teaches about has things to say about same-sex sexual relationships. You didn't tell me all this stuff. You left all that stuff out. Either way, when you just give them all the, all the good stuff that's not true or you leave out the other stuff you think's a bit harsh, at the end of the day, people feel ripped off and they have a right to feel ripped off. So we need to be preaching the whole counsel of God. We've become hypersensitive to anything that we might think could be offensive to the world in which we live. A world which, by the way, we're in but not of. Now, Jesus would say that's being more concerned with the things of men than things of God. And maybe, maybe there are some people here, and as we talk about some of this stuff, one of those two things that concerns for you, what's it going to mean to you? Or maybe you're sitting there going, yeah, but I'm concerned about what it's going to mean for other people. Maybe that's you. And I, and I just want to say up front, I understand that. I understand that because I'm a mix of those things too. Okay? But I didn't write the word of God. I'm not God, and I don't have a right to change it. I've got to get in line with it. Or the third reason, the third potential reason why Peter... Rebuke Jesus. We're concerned about how this truth will impact the image of my God. Remember, Jesus is, uh, Peter's committed his life to follow Jesus. Jesus is Peter's Messiah, right? So, so whatever you do out there, Jesus, that, ref, that kind of reflects a bit on me, doesn't it? Isn't that how we think? That reflects a bit on me. I don't want to be, I don't want to be associated with a church that does that. Let's be real. How many of you have seen things that churches have done or pastors have done or heard of movements and you've gone as a follower of Jesus with all your heart gone, I don't want to be associated with that. Am I the only person in the room? I read it all the time, I see it all the time. There are things out there that I look at and a part of me goes, geez, I'm really concerned about the image of God you're portraying. I don't think God's as concerned as I am. I think God is very, very secure and, and not sitting there going, oh no, they're making me look bad. God is who he is. End of story. But I understand that we can be concerned about that, and maybe that's what Peter was thinking. A Messiah who's willing to walk passively to his own death is not the type of Messiah the Jews were looking for. And a Jesus who calls us to sacrificial love, turn the other cheek, and give boundaries to sexual relations, calls for integrity of heart, not just outward observance of rules, requires obedience and holiness, etc., that Jesus might not be the one the world today is looking for either. Might not be the one they're looking for either. Public image is everything in today's society. So maybe Peter wanted Jesus to project a more healthy, balanced image if he was going to be the face of this new movement called The Way. We look at the church today and there's so many factions in the church, so many divisions over different things. And what's going on in culture right now is it breaks my heart when I look at the church and go, it's almost like we've got this section of the church that's going, we're cooler than that section of the church. You guys are old fuddy-duddies over there. So we're going to come over here and we're going to... And, and I, I, if you come to this church, you know my heart. So I'm trusting that you're not offended by what I'm saying. And if you have questions, please come and ask me or give me a call during the week. I'm more than happy to talk one-on-one -on -one with you about any of this stuff. But there are factions of the church that are going way over this side to put their arms around current culture in the world and pointing their finger back at their own brothers and sisters and going, we want you to know we love you, we're not like them. We're one body. One. Jesus didn't come to create several bodies. Yeah. We're one body, one body. And it's terrible. I think it breaks the heart of God what he's seeing going on now in the church over these cultural issues that we won't necessarily go to the word of God, bring our concerns to him. I think God understands our concerns. I don't think God, uh, uh, I don't think God is heartless to the concerns that we have. But at the end of the day, there's still only one Lord and one God. Some people are over there where the cool Christians, where the truly loving Christians, where the genuinely compassionate Christians. We're not one of those Christians over there. Jesus was more concerned with walking out the will of God than catering to the will of man, regardless of how men felt about it or regardless of how people perceived it. I'll just get the musas to come on back. We can finish up. Jesus says to Peter, rebukes him, says, get behind me, Satan. 
His rebuke was also a call to Peter to reposition himself. Remember? Peter's out in front going, never, this won't happen. And Jesus reminds Peter, get behind me. I'm the leader here. You're the follower. You're the follower. And sometimes I think we can forget that. And maybe there are some people here and you know where we're going. You know we're going to be talking about some of these issues and, and we've been flagging this for a few weeks now. And maybe you're sitting here and maybe you fit into one of those three categories. Maybe, maybe you're sitting there going, well, I don't know if I want to know really what, what the Bible really says because I'm quite happy just thinking what I think. You know, one, one, of the, one of the things I'm very big on and I say it to my wife and my kids and, and anyone I talk to, it's, it's not necessarily just good enough to know what you believe. I want to know why you believe it. Why do you believe it? Show me. Come on, let's get in this collection of ancient documents. Let's have a look. Because when the world goes, you believe what? And we go, I believe this. And they go, why? Oh, just because. Because God said, show me where he says it. Let's walk through it. Show me. Let the word of God do its job. And maybe you're sitting here and maybe you're, one of those three reasons resonates with you. You're worried about when we talk about some of this stuff, what's it going to impact on me? Or maybe you're sitting there going, you know what? I don't like this because I think this, what impact is it going to have on others? Or maybe you're sitting there and you're worried about, but what's this going to, to be, mean for the church? What are people going to think about my God? Or maybe what are people going to think about my church? I go to a rise church. I want people thinking a rise church is this and that and that. Well, I, I think Jesus understands all of that. But what's interesting is this. Jesus rebukes Peter, says, get behind me, Satan. And then he does this. Then he turns to his disciples. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. When we, think about that, when we think about that statement, Jesus saying deny yourself, you know what we think about? We straight away go to sinful desires. We've got to des de deny all the desires. Well, hang on, that's not the context that Jesus is talking about. That's not at all the context. What he's saying is those thoughts that you have, like Peter's just expressed, that are not in line with the will of God. You've got to deny them and accept what God has to say. Peter says, this ain't going to happen. Jesus just said, this is how God sees it. This is the plan. Peter said, that's not the plan. And Jesus says, all you guys, you're going to have to deny yourself. You may not agree with me on everything. You may not like everything I say. You may not understand everything I'm saying. But as my follower, you need to come to a place of accepting it. Accepting it. Because I said it. So denying ourselves is not a prerequisite for salvation. It's an ongoing process as we continue to walk with Jesus. As we come across different perspectives, as we wrestle with Scripture, as our own perceived, preconceived ideas or cultural biases are challenged, as the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to more and more revelation, we continue to slowly, daily, deny ourselves, our personal preferences and our opinions, and readjust ourselves to get back behind Jesus and follow him again. You're not going to like some of the things that he teaches. You're not going to understand some things. You're not going to agree with them. But we need to accept them as followers of Jesus. Luke 6, 46 to 49. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? In other words, you can't. Sorry. Lord means something. If you're going to call me Lord. He says, as for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, what's he saying? You've made Christianity your way of life. Hear my words, you put it into practice, you do it. He says, I'll show you what they're like. He says, they're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid a foundation on a rock. And when the floods came, the torrent struck, that house could not shake it. The storms came, the torrents came, there was still pressure and there was still testing and there was still stuff that was very, very uncomfortable. But because the house was built on what Jesus had said, it stood. He says, but those who hear my words and do not put them into practice. Who's he talking about? People that are sitting in church this morning, listening to the words of Jesus. You're hearing them, but you're going to get up and walk out of here and go, I don't care. This is my opinion. I don't care. This is what I believe. I don't care. This is what I think. And Jesus is saying, well, why do you, you can't really call me Lord, Lord then. You're the Lord, because you're the final say. You're the God of your own will. 
It says, the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed. And its destruction was complete. There was something inside of Peter that reacted against the teaching of Jesus in that moment. And Jesus' response to that was, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And so that's my challenge. That's what I want to throw out there this week. Next week, we're going to dive into some of these things. But I just want to leave you with that thought that you may not agree and you may not like and you may not feel comfortable to you. I'll be the first one to say, I don't like a lot of things Jesus teaches, but he's my Lord. I don't agree with a lot of things Jesus teaches, but he's my Lord. A lot of things Jesus teaches don't make me feel comfortable. But I made a decision at 19 that he would become my Lord. So I'll wrestle with Jesus on that. But here's the thing. I'm committed to letting Jesus win every time. I'll accept it because he knows a little more than me. Let's, can we stand together? Stand together. I, 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 I want to acknowledge, I just want to acknowledge that I know that for some people, we all have opinions and perspectives on this. And I just want to pray for all of us that we would be able to lay down our own preferences, our own preconceived ideas, our own fears of what is it, what's it going to mean to me. Maybe there are people here going, yeah, but I really believe that. What does that mean for this relationship with this person over here? Hey, nothing that Jesus taught is going to stop you from loving somebody, yeah. treating them with value and dignity. Nothing Jesus taught means that a person who doesn't obey it or live it is not made in his image. We're all made in the image of God. But if we're going to shine a light, then a city on a hill can't be hidden. We don't want to hide who we really are for the sake of thinking that's a better witness. No, no, no. You don't light a lamp and then cover it over, Jesus says, because as soon as you put the cover over the lamp, nobody gets any of the light. We think we're doing the right thing. We'll just cover these things over. Well, your light's not shining anymore. We're as dull and as dead as the rest of the world. So I just want to pray. I just want to pray a blanket prayer for us this morning. If you want to have a chat afterwards, come and grab us or grab somebody. If you, you, you're here this morning and you'd like prayer for anything, uh, maybe you've got stuff going on in your world, maybe there's some physical stuff, we'd love to pray for you. We believe in a God who heals, who delivers, who sets free. Uh, we believe in a God that breaks change. We believe in a God that helps us physically, mentally, emotionally. Uh, all those areas, he's a holistic God who's interested in your world. We'd love to pray with you this morning. But I just want to pray for us all right now. Father, I thank you. Lord, for your word. God, I thank you, Father, that you are trustworthy. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have never told a lie to humanity. God, I thank you that you said that you have come to give us life and life abundantly. Therefore, nothing that you have taught, nothing that you say about human existence is designed to rip life away from us. It's all designed to enhance our quality of life down here because you promised us that you came to give us life. Father, in the Old Testament, you tell us to choose life. And life is found in obeying and walking with God. And so, Father, I pray as we go on this uh, journey over the next few weeks, Lord, each of us in this room, give us the ability to lay aside all those things that are going on inside of us. God, remind us. Remind us again of what it means. What did it mean that day that we surrendered our life to you? God, what did it mean? What were we saying in our heart, Father? Lord, we came to a place where we were at the end of ourselves and we said, we can't do this. Lord, we need you. And God, maybe there's people in this room that, that over that journey, we've started to take things back. We're saved. I've got my fire insurance. I'm going to heaven. But that radical ability and call to follow Jesus has been, been, been watered down. And God, I pray for those people, Lord. Would you spark that flame again in their hearts, Father? That, Lord, we would, we would follow you to the cross. We would follow you to, to the death of our own sinful desires, to the death of our own opinions, God, to the death of our own perspectives. We would take that journey with you over these coming weeks, Father. And God, I pray as we do that, that, Lord, you would, in, in each person's heart and in each person's life, God, would you, would you show them? Would you show them and bring to them the blessing that comes with truly letting go and letting you be the Lord? And Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Amen.